Mr. Who moved aside a full ashtray with a show of distaste and rearranged the clues. Purple fruited makes more sense. Grace Wexler looked across the restaurant to the lone figure at the window. Are you sure your wife doesn't understand English? I mean, after living here so long? That's my second wife. She came over from Hong Kong two years ago. She does look young, but it's so hard to tell ages of people of the Oriental persuasion, Grace said. Why was he glaring at her like that? Your wife is quite lovely, you know. So doll-like and inscrutable. Who bit off half a chocolate bar? He had enough problems with the empty restaurant, a lazy son, and his nagging ulcer. Now he has to put up with this bigot. Grace lit another cigarette and rearranged the clues to read Purple Waves. You heard the doorman say purple waves. It must mean something. And that ghastly secretary was wearing a dress with purple waves last night, not to mention her crutch. You should not speak unkindly of those less fortunate than you, who said. You're quite right, Grace replied. I thought the poor thing handled her infirmity with great courage. Traveling mimosa, my future son-in-law says. He's a doctor, you know. Anyhow, Pulaski couldn't possibly be the murderer. Not the way she gimps around. Besides, how could my Uncle Sam know she'd wear purple waves to his funeral? Who waved the cigarette smoke from his face? The murderer must have a motive. How about this? A niece murders her rich uncle to inherit his money. Good sport that she was, Grace tossed her head back and uttered an amused, ha, ha, ha. Not that I care, who said. That cheating money bag's got what he deserved. What's the matter? Look! Grace pointed to the clues. Fruited purple waves for C. Four C. The murderer lives in apartment four C. I live in four C. Who barked? If Sam Westing wanted to say four C, he would have written the number four, letter C. S E A means C, like what a turtle swims in. Come now, Mister Who. We're both being silly. Have you spoken to your son about his clues? Some son. If you can catch him, you can ask him. Who stuffed the rest of the candy bar in his mouth? In some business I've got here. Every border, everybody orders up. Nobody orders down. That coffee shop is sending me to the poorhouse. And your Angela and that Pulaski woman, they didn't show us the will. They didn't give us their clues. They didn't pay for their three cups of jasmine tea and six almond cookies. And you smoke too much. And you eat too much. Grace threw her coin purse on the table and stormed out of the restaurant change. That's all he'd get from her. He'd have to beg on his knees before she'd sign Grace Windsor Wexler on that $10,000 check, that madman. Some pair they made, Attila the Hun and Gracie the Useless. Gracie Winkloppel Wexler, air pretender, pretentious heir. First, the money. They signed their names to the check. Half would go into Doug's savings account. Half would go to Theo's parents. Next, the clues. His, N, on, to, the, four. Maybe they're numbers. One, two, three, four, Theo guessed. I still say on is no, the board track star said. He clasped his hands behind his head, leaned back in the coffee shop booth, and stretched his long legs under the opposite bench. And no is what we got. No real clues. No leads, no will. After three cups of coffee, two pastries, and a bowl of rice pudding with cream, Seidel Pulaski had offered nothing in return. Theo refused to give up. Are you sure you didn't see anything unusual at the Westinghouse that night? I didn't kill Westing, if that's what you mean, and the only unusual thing I saw was Turtle Wexler. I think the press is madly in love with me. How's that for luck? Get serious, Doug. One of the ears is a murderer. We could all get killed. Just because somebody zapped the old man doesn't mean he's going to kill us, Dad said. Doug paused. 
his father's comment about awarding a medal to the murderer might be incriminating. Theo tried another tack. I was playing chess with somebody in the game room last night. Who? That's what's strange. I don't know who. We'll have to find out which one of the heirs plays chess. Since when is chess playing evidence for murder? Well, it's something to go on, Theo replied. And another thing. The will said no two sets of clues are alike. Maybe all the clues put together make one message. A message that points to the murderer. Somehow or other, we'll have to get the heirs to pool their, their clues. Oh, sure. The killer can't wait to hand over the clues that will hang him. Doug rose. Snowbound or not, he had to stay in shape for the track meet. For the rest of the day, he jogged through the hallways and up and down the stairs, scaring the nervous tenants half out of their wits. Judge J.J. Ford had no doubt that the clues she shared with the doorman were meant for her, but Sam Westing tossed off sharper results than Skies Am Shining Brothers. His choice of words must have been limited. Therefore, these clues were part of a longer statement, a statement that named a name, the name of the murderer. No. Mr. Westing could not have been murdered. If his life had been threatened, if he had been in danger of any kind, he would have insisted on police protection. He owned the police. He owned the whole town. Sam Westing was not the type to let himself get killed. Not unless he was insane. The judge opened the envelope given her by the incompetent slum. A certificate of sanity, dated last week. Having thoroughly examined... Keen mind and memory. Excellent physical condition. Signed, Sidney Sykes, M.D. Sykes. That sounded familiar. The judge scanned the obituary she had cut from Saturday's newspaper. Samuel Westing and his friend, Dr. Sidney Sykes, were involved in a near-fatal automobile accident. Both men were hospitalized with severe injuries. Sykes resumed his Westingtown medical practice and the, the post of county coroner, but Westing disappeared from sight. Stop there for just a moment and take note of the information highlighted in pink. This information will help you answer one of the questions. Continuing on, Sykes was Westing's friend and she remembered a witness to the will, but he was also a physician in good standing. She would accept his opinion on Westing's sanity, for the time being at least. Back to the clues. Look at her, the big time judge fussing over scraps of Westing's super strength paper towels. Forget the clues, she said aloud, rising from her desk to putter about the room. Nibbling on a macaroon, she stacked the used coffee cups on a tray. If only that Pulaski person had let her study the will. That's where the real clues were buried, among the veiled threats and pompous promises, the slogans and, still and stillness in that hodgepodge of a will. In his will, Sam Westing had implied, he did not state, he implied, that he, wa that he one, was murdered, two, the murderer was one of the heirs, three, he alone knew the name of the murderer, and four, the name of the murderer was the answer to the game. Please take note of the information highlighted in pink. If you need to, please pause the video to answer the corresponding question. The game, a tricky, divisive Westing game. No matter how much fear and suspicion he instilled in the players, Sam Westing knew that greed would keep them playing the game until the murderer was captured and punished. Sam Westing was not Werner, but one of his heirs was guilty, guilty of some offense against a relentless man, and that heir was in danger. From his grave, Westing would stalk his enemy, and through his heirs, he would wreak his revenge. Which one? Which heir was the target of, Went of Westing's vindictiveness? In the name of justice, she would have to find Westing's victims before the others did. She would have to learn everything she could about each of the heirs who they are, and how did their lives touch Westings, these 16 strangers whose only connection with one another was Sunset Towers. Sunset Towers. She'd start from there.
the information highlighted in pink is actually going to connect to something later in the reading in chapter 10. So please just make note of this for now. Um, it will help you later on. Good. The telephones were working again. The number she dialed was answered on the first ring. Hi there, this is a recording of yours truly, Barney Northrup. I'm at your service as soon as I get back in my office, that is. Just sing out your problem to old Barney here when you hear the beep. Beep. J.J. Ford hung up without singing out her problem to old Barney. He, too, could be involved in Westing's plot. Newspaper. She would try the newspaper. Surely someone was snowbound there. After eight rings, a live voice answered. We don't usually supply that kind of information over the phone, but since it's you, Judge Ford, I'll be happy to oblige. Just spell out the names and I'll call back if I find anything. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. It was the beginning. Sam Westing was dead, but maybe, just once, she could beat him at his own game. His last game. Having found out what she wanted in Turtle's desk, Angela returned to her frilly bedroom, where Seidel Pulaski, glasses low on her nose, was perched on a ruffled stool at the vanity table, smearing blue shadow on her eyelids. First, we tackle our own clues, the secretary said, frowning at the result in the threefold mirror. Unlucky from the day she was born, she now had a beautiful and well-loved partner. There was always a chance that they alone had been given the answer. She unsealed the envelope and held it out to Angela. Take one. Angela removed the first clue. Good. Now it was Seidel's turn. Glory be, she exclaimed, thinking she had the name of the murderer. Her thumb was covering the letter D. The word was hood. Angela's turn. The third clue was from. Seidel's turn. The fourth clue was spacious. The fifth and last clue was, Angela uttered a low moan. Her hand shook as she passed the paper to her partner. The fifth and last clue was Grace. Grace, that's your mother's name, isn't it? Seidel said. Well, don't worry. That clue doesn't mean your mother's the murderer. The will says it's not what you have, it's what you don't have that counts. The secretary had not yet transcribed the shorthand, but she had read it through several times before hiding notebook in a safe place. By the way, are you really related to Mr. Westing? Angela shrugged. Seidel assumed that that meant no and turned to the clues. Good grace from Hood Spacious. The only thing I can figure from these clues is good gracious from Hood Space. As soon as the parking lot is shoveled out, we'll peek under the hoods of all the cars. A map or more clues may be hidden there, even the murder weapon. Now, let's hear about the other clues. Angela reported on the clues gathered in the game room during the day's comings and goings. King, Queen, Otis Amber said King Otis and King and Queen Crow. Purple Waves, Mother switched two clues around when Sandy mentioned those words. On or no, Doug and Theo could not decide whether or not that clue was right, right side up or upside down. Grains. Chris Theodorakis thinks that the clue refers to Otis Amber. You know, grains, oats. M.T. Angela showed her partner the crumpled scrap of paper she had picked up along with Seidel's dropped crutch during Flora Bombach's tea party. I checked Turtle's diary. She's not following any stock with a symbol like M.T., so it must be one of her clues. M.T. could stand for either mountain or empty. Taking a look at everything that I just had highlighted, how did Angela and Seidel get so many clues? Think back to what happened in chapter seven. What did Angela and Seidel do differently than the other characters? 